Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome, at least for the, those who are new here. Uh, my name is Christian Daas. I'm from uh, Belgium, Antwerp. And uh, it's not the first time I'm here at TDOS. It's always be good to be back. It's a nice conference to talk to. Uh, my talk will be on business continuity planning in general and also um, together with Barrios and Relax and Recover, abbreviated as REAR. Okay. Maybe first, before we kick off, who am I? I'm a, an old timer in the Unix environment. <laughs> Been in the Unix, Unix user since 86, uh, to be at least. In uh, 91, in the last previous century, I started with Linux, so I think it was that zero one version of Linux. So I was one of the first, at least in Belgium, I think. Um, a long time open source uh, contributor and also organizer of uh, conferences in Belgium uh, in the 90s. In the open source community, I'm involved with uh, several open source projects. And the first one I had was the Make CDROM Recovery, or abbreviated MKCDREC, which is, has been uh, replaced by Relax and Recover. Uh, about Relax and Recover, open source started in 2006, together with Shlomo Shapiro of uh, Berlin. And um, I already gave a talk here at TDOS about Relax and Recover and on other occasions, of course. And some other uh, open source projects which are very nice, like config to html I'm the main contributor for uh, HPX, and also one of the contributors for the Linux tracks in config to html At called Copy and Run, I think two years ago I gave an, uh, a presentation here at TDOS about it. It's uh, something run to expect, and uh, a, light, a little nice utility, which I still use a lot. The WebM Extras is about the um, installation of HP SIM, uh, configuration, upgrading, and monitoring. All right. And Upgrade UX is something that I started this year for mass uh, upgrading and patch updating of HPX systems, but also for Solaris, AUX, and Linux systems. It's to have a nice um, logging facility, and you can control everything. But I will give a talk at FOSDEM about that. All right. Okay, some buzzwords. Uh, you all heard business continuity planning and the misunderstood uh, buzzword that I hear at conferences and even in papers is that I talk about business continuity, but they're really talking about disaster recovery. It's not the same. So another buzzword is backup replication. That's all part of. And if you want to have be a really hip these days, you just add cloud in front of it. Okay. <laughs> So it's not the same as business continuity. So let's start with it. Some a bit figures. I think this is a nice uh, interpretation of uh, its data is coming from HPM, uh, IBM. Not uh, um, the most common disasters. When we call it a disaster, is still from data loss and power loss. And natural disasters, because th these are the, the most hip ones that you see, uh, Katrina or uh, the towers that uh, fall down, that is, of course, is a major disaster, of course. But that is not the major type of disaster that we have. Another one is networking, quite a lot of. We had, we had last week one uh, a big issue in the States, uh, in the company that I work for. Um, a lot of big data centers were just disconnected. So it does happen. And also a nice one is software bugs. Um, we hit one also, well, always me it seems. Um, software was, was um, cluster software which was not updated uh, very well. Uh, it was too old and we added some new patches and suddenly the network was gone. And it was because of uh, IP filtering that was turned on all of a sudden. Normally, the cluster software can handle that because it was so old, it was not patched for that. I think it might be dropped. Okay, I dropped it. Drop it yeah. Sorry about it. Hope it, hope it stays now. And also a nice one is human factor. Um, 
not to be underestimated. I'll come back to that uh, point later. So, business continuity. Yeah? I'm planning. It's about how to minimize your service interruption. Uh, that's the goal of it. A uh, very important goal if you have a warehouse with a multi-billion dollar business, uh, you don't want interruptions. And that's the first thing. If something critical happens, that's a come to me. It costs us $100,000 an hour. Okay, a very good way to start your uh, disaster recovery or your business continuity planning. It's all about the money. I will come to that to, uh, at the end of the presentation. It's all about the money. So, important to understand this, business continuity is about business and business services. It's not the same as disaster recovery, that's about technology. I will explain it later in the presentation. So business, core business operations, very important. If you understand that difference, you are on a good track already. This is a very nice overview of business continuity. You have four main chapters. And I will go over each chapter individually and explain it a little bit before I continue with the presentation. If I want you to remember something from this presentation, it's about this slide. And this slide will uh, come back a few times. Prevention is all about risk management. Um, I think this chapter can cost you a lot of money, but is far the cheapest one. You can gain a lot of money by risk management. Okay? And after prevention, you have preparedness. Uh, you, if, if you know you could be hit by a disaster or by one of things that can interrupt your business, being prepared is very important. Uh, that's all about paperwork and analysis, uh, business impact analysis. And afterwards, if something you're really hit and you have a disaster, you call it a disaster, and uh, the response team, very important to have a response team. And at least when you do have to recover, it's a recovery chapter itself. And it's a cyclus. And it's something that you have to rehearse on a periodically basis, and you have to maintain and review. So these are the main overviews. Prevention. It's all about the risks, of course. Um, there are five main steps in risk management. First of all, you have to identify the risks. Uh, you have to make them, and also in, uh, examine how the impact could be on your business. It's still about the business. Eh? It's not technical that I'm talking, it's just business impact. And you have to make a priority list of all the risks that you have. And step four is perhaps the one that can gain a lot of money afterwards. Um, you have to treat them. For example, for a hospital, a uh, hospital, what is the biggest risk that I could have? Is the doctor that not showing up? No. It's that during the middle of an operation that the electricity falls out. It's also a kind of disaster. The mic drops off. <laughs> so electricity is very important for a hospital. Therefore, in their business continuity planning, and UPS is extremely important. And not the UPS that we know that starts up after two minutes. No, no, it should be continuously online and within a millisecond, by way of speaking, it should be there. So there should be no interruption during an operation. So it all depends according to your business. Okay? And treating a risk, uh, if you are in the computer business, you could say dual power supplies, dual network connections, dual network providers, stuff like that, that can interrupt or prevent interruption. That's part of the treatment. And step five is you have to develop and review on a periodic basis uh, this analysis of your risks. Okay? That's about the risk management. I already mentioned you have to monitor your risk because your business is a flowing thing. Also, your risks will evaluate during time. More risk will come up, others will disappear. It depends a bit. And there's a point in the why, which is very important, if you have a big business, if you do a lot of risk prevention, the insurance fee will decrease. It's very important. It's, you, you, you spend money on it, but you also gain a lot of money with it. So, 
And also top management has to be involved and uh, over time with risk management, risk monitoring, you will reduce the amount of interruptions of your IT department, of your network, of your telephone system, um, things like that. For example, telephone systems, it's uh, communication is very important during a business continuity. Uh, maybe it's also good to foresee a telephone system in the cloud. Or if you have a one cell operator to have two cell operators, that you always have a continuity. Uh, if, if everything drops out, you can't communicate, it's very risky. So reducing loss damage to equipment in general is a very good uh, statement that you will gain with risk management and the monitoring of it. But again, prevention is a lot more. I uh, mentioned here a lot of uh, items here and don't want to go over them all together. But uh, to name a few, it's quality control, that's again risk prevention effect. Um, training of your staff, hiring good staff, um, cloud computing is also a kind of uh, risk management that you not always put your entire data center in one. Sometimes you may not put data in your cloud because on FD, FDA rules or other SOX um, rules that your uh, critical data may not be in the cloud for reasons that are quite evident, uh, stuff like that. Also the maintenance, if I, if I, evacuation plans are important because your biggest asset is still and still are people. Uh, if you lose your key people, you know, could be out of business. And drills and tests and stuff like that, backups, offsite. The next chapter is about the preparedness uh, and the biggest impact is how can you become prepared? That's by doing. Um, well, in fact, is if you take action before an incident happens, you're always thinking about preparing yourself. That's a good thing. Um, being proactive is important, and never think it will not happen to me. Uh, it always happens to you. And normally, when an incident happens, there are more than one incident. Believe me, uh, I've been there several times. It's always something unexpected. And it's always the human factor <laughs> that comes uh, around the corner and gives you another problem. So business impact analysis. So it's about business core business. And now we are going more to the business processes. So we're going drilling deeper into your business uh, as a whole effect. You're looking at your vital processes now. You also have to do the same as with risk management. You make a list of all your critical processes and you do that in a broad group. So not only IT people, but also business people, even people from the top because they have to prevent, uh, to prevent not to give you money for it. And other kind of people, financial people, even sales. Uh, everybody has to have to his saying about what is critical for them about the processes. You have to understand it. You have to communicate. And why the management is important to, be, to have them involved, because it will cost money. Uh, if you have to be prepared, preparedness is a kind of an insurance, it costs you money. Very important, it should be cross-departmental. It's not only IT. Uh, IT is a big bunch of it, I know, but it's not the only thing. Uh, I will give you an example in a short while. Okay. So the, in that group, you have to define what are the time frames that you want to have a recovery of your processes. I don't talk about in your IT equipment, eh? it's part of it, but your processes. So the RTO is about the time frame, in which time frame you want to recover. The RPO is about the point of recovery, it's about data. And the zero downtime, believe me, that's an utopia. Some companies will sell you that, we have it, we can do it. Uh, I would say near zero downtown, that's more acceptable as a term. But be aware, it is extremely costly. Uh, I know a few customers who are doing that, it's extremely costly. Uh, you can buy a few fillers with it, uh, by way of speaking, on a yearly basis. Okay? And you need guidance of the executive, because it's all about the money. And you need some guidance also by good consultants who are good in the practice of it, because if you do it for the first time, it's a nightmare. Everybody thinks 
his business is important. That's not true. Therefore, I will give you an example in a short while. I think these terms are quite important uh, to remember. RPO, it's about the data. How much data are you willing to lose? Because the less you want to lose, the more expensive it becomes. Right? If you are good with a backup of an hourly backup, it's fine. It's 50 minutes, it's less than 15, it's five minutes, one minute, almost nothing. Then you need other kind of technology. Then only a backup is not enough. RTO is about the time object that you want to have a recovery in. The lower time frame that you want, the more expensive it becomes. Again, if you want only a near zero downtime recovery in time frame speaking, then you need more high availability options, but also uh, what we call um, um, bigger clusters, uh, kind of clusters which are continental clusters uh, that, that can switch over of kind of, you have it also in the cloud, uh, a kind of V-motion with an instant V-motion or a high availability V-motion that is instantly uh, going over to the other side. Uh, it be will become costly. Even in the cloud, it's only a click away, they say, but a click will cost you a lot of money. I don't tell you that um, on the first click. Only after the next month, I will tell you. Again, the last point, focus on the critical processes. It's quite important because you cannot foresee in your complete business process to have everything back at once. Okay? I think this is a very nice slide because we are always talking about RPO, the data of RPO, the time, but we in fact should talk about the maximum tolerable outputs. What is the time frame? Because that's the, what the business, the CEO, the CTO, or the CFO is a, are understanding. You have an incident, or you declare an incident, in which time frame I have it, my business back, of my critical processes back. And I don't care about the RPO, the RTO. They care about the total time frame. And that's mostly forgotten, because if you declare an incident, and I've been there several times, it takes hours before they decide what to do with it. Huh? Uh, they, they say, it's a disaster, now we can do it maybe this, we can try this, we can try that. that. That's not... Uh, the, the, the hours are lost due to that, that. And before they say, now it's a disaster, we declare a disaster and we have to push the button to fail over or uh, to recover or whatever. And that is a time that is forgotten a lot. And, and they say, oh, we have an RTO, RPO of four hours, but they spent eight hours before declaring the push the button. So that's important to, to explain it to top management. What are your times that you want your business back? Because for a bank, 15 minutes is quite a long time. They lose hundreds of millions with that. For a pharmaceutical company, two hours, and then they feel the pain already. They lose hundreds of thousands of dollars on that time frame. So it costs money. It's all about the money, again. But at least the invocation lead time is a less understood principle of your disaster business continuity planning. It's very important to understand that. And this is a nice explanation of your uh, total picture of that. Okay. I will explain a, a little example. It's about a company that is a retailer. It's only online. Um, a catalog of 25,000 items, not that big. It has a message board, you can communicate with your uh, people, it's on, on site somewhere, and they're all in one location. Which is not that good, your data center is there, data, data center is there, uh, your uh, people are there, call center is there, and your warehouse is there. So the, the center point of problem could be your building, of course. Huh? Okay, you're not in a disaster mode yet, but you have to do a business impact analysis. What do you do? What are the problems that we could face? You make just a list. A theft, of course. Internal, external is a problem, so you could guard with that. A fire could be very critical. A flu, depends where you're located. Earthquakes also. Power outage is one of the most common, I would say. Server crash, critical servers. Software could be a problem, you upgrade, something fails. Do not underestimate the key personal, because that's sometimes uh, not understood very well. And also being hacked or a denial of service attack of your central website because your 
doing your business is online, so it's quite important. And the last one is always a nice one, the water pipe burst. I had it already twice in my uh, IT life. There's no water in the ceiling of my computer room, but the next door there's a water pipe bursting, and through the ceiling it drips just above the CPU. There's a lot of space to drip, but no, it decides to drip above your CPU. Okay, that can happen. So it's not a lie, it does happen. So what do you do? You have to identify your key processes, because not all the processes that you are doing in your completely business chains are even or equally important. What is important for that kind of company is the orders. Right? You, you want to sell. You have to track your orders, of course, and therefore you need computers. Online assistance, yes, somebody picks up the phone. Credit cards, yeah, you want to sell, so you need uh, money. The message board, searching the database, your items, IT maintenance, and so on and so on. If you have that key processes, then afterwards you have your interdependencies, because there are a lot of more stuff, stock refilling perform, uh, legally, public relations, budgets, financial reports, and so on and so on. Um, with that total picture, uh, you have to think what is important, what is not important. You have to make a priority list. That is the next step. Impact on the operations. Yeah? What is important for that kind of business is the online store. Yeah? Because that is the core business, the, the online store. And of course, if you want to sell, they want to get money back. It's the credit card stuff. Rebuilding, if uh, you have a fire, it's very important. Uh, you have to find another building as, as soon as possible. The message board is at the moment that there's an, a disaster, not that important. And the product shorts, okay, it's not that important, but I would say communication on your website is very important. If you communicate you have a disaster, people are very tolerable. They will say, okay, uh, that company has a problem. Uh, we have an order that is pending, we will not cancel it. Okay. If you do not say anything, they will just go to the not another store. Financial reporting is also not that important because it's a disaster anyway. And it's all based on revenue, very important. The revenue is making the list from high to low. That's for that simple company. Now that was the next chapter in the business continuity planning is the response. Therefore, you need an incident response team. That is a team of experts. Um, they have to understand, they have to be drilled, they have to understand all the procedures. And in that response team, you have a team leader, uh, and you have some spokesperson, and somebody who talks to the business, talks to the customers, talks to the press, uh, makes the interventions to the web for uh, Twitter, stuff like that. Uh, everybody has his own task, in fact, in that team. It's very uh, in in important to understand, and also, when an incident happens, it doesn't have to be a real disaster, but a disaster can be something smaller. Huh? That team should be doing only that. And if they have other tasks, but normally they have an other job, they should not be interrupted by other teams. And they have their main concern is that incident and the incident only. And this kind of teams, I've seen that in the very big companies that do, do exist and that do often use them, and sometimes I'm part of it. Okay, the team must be aware of all the procedures, of course, must be aware of who they should contact, so there, there should be a kind of emergency bag, a eh? bag that you pick up when there's an emergency, you run like a fireman, and you have all your things in there, a telephone, uh, and even a laptop, your procedures are printed, even on CD, for example, USB, and even on the cloud, you can have Google the clouds and stuff like that. Uh, everything should be available and they should be aware of it. If you change it, they should be updated. And so on. Okay. Uh, activating. Um, well, of course, if there is a real problem, they should be aware of the strategy to follow, how to fix it or to resolve it or the track that they should uh, make. The spokesman or spokeswoman should be aware of the communication. Uh, and communication is very important, do not underestimate it. Uh, if you do not say anything, you're busy with it, they think you're doing nothing. So, but there should be one person doing the communication, otherwise you're always interrupted and that's not very good for your concentration. 
and the team should be um, trained in the case something really happens always be trained for the worst it can only be better done okay and use your experts for their word and you can pick an expert use it for something when it's done that thing or you say that's not a problem you may let them go to back into his normal business so that's very important the SMEs should be used whenever they are needed I see sometimes they are dragged in and they are keeping them there for hours and hours that's not needed and when you need them they are not concentrated so only use them when they are needed but you should uh, tell them be standby if they are standby then they know they could be called okay all right that was a very small uh, chapter the recovery or the recovery plans um, now we come to the chapter effect where your disaster recovery planning is important and disaster recovery planning is effect drilling down but more in this case is more like for IT right? and, and that's where the other companies if they're talking business continuity they're talking about your IT infrastructure but it's, it's only a part of it so it's part of the business continuity planning so I hope most are aware what disaster recovery planning is and they are doing it. Um, okay, I hope so. It's about your property, uh, about your IT, it's about uh, everything, software. Uh, again, here, if you don't do it properly, you can have a lot of disinterruptions or interruptions uh, and also damage to your computers, software, loss of data, and also here insurance if you prove that you have a decent disaster recovery plan insurance fees can drop I think this is a very nice definition um, it's a big one it's a very long one but I highlighted the most important part of it disaster recovery is about technology infrastructure like business continuity is about business processes it's different this is really technology and now we are coming to the core of the presentation effect. What is disaster recovery? Not, it's not backup. You may have backup is needed, of course. It's absolutely necessary, but it's only a small part of disaster recovery. If you have a good backup schemes, you will lower your RPO, because that's about the data. You can restore the data as soon as possible. You can restore your data with for example, relax and recover to a certain point in time, but then you still have to recover a lot of data of your uh, SAP system or whatever, and it doesn't matter what it is. But you don't have it at the moment that you took your snapshot that's old, eh? it could be weeks old. You still have to restore a lot of data, so going using backups is very important. But it's about data uh, loss prevention effect. Data replication. It's also very important, but that's not really disaster recovery. It's a part of it. And this data replication, you have to see it if you have two data centers. Uh, it's always good to have two data centers to replicate critical data to the other center. Could be uh, SAN, could be NAS, could be other schemes. You could use our sync a way of speaking. Uh, also here, if your RPO is very important, our sync is good, but you will never have a near zero possibility. If you want near zero, uh, data loss then you need something like continuous access uh, that is continuously uh, almost synchronously in fact uh, syncing data to the other side of your data center and also high availability um, that's also not the same as disaster recovery that will only give you a prevention of losing data or losing RTO in fact and that means uh, you lower the time of filling over but it's in case, in case of your disaster happens on your clusters, and it does happen, because we had one a few times, a few weeks ago again, uh, I told you with the IP filter stuff, then, then you need disaster recovery. You have to uh, be able to uh, recover your cluster, and afterwards you can restore your data, or resync your data, or whatever, to start it up again. So, so disaster recovery is an added value to all these things so backup is important data replication is important and also high availability can help you to reduce the RTOs okay. 
And now we come to the buzzword, cloud. You just put cloud before disaster recovery, you have cloud disaster recovery. What is all about? Um, if you have not a huge uh, company and you don't have the means to have two data centers, you can always say, I, go, I use some critical components and you can put it in the cloud to have cloud disaster recovery. There are several ways. Uh, there are companies who are doing it completely for you. Uh, they help you to move your data, whatever. Uh, but there's also an approach for do it yourself. Do it yourself is, of course, uh, it's maybe it's more expensive to start with. You need the knowledge, you have to do learning curves and stuff like that. So it takes a lot of time to get acquainted with all the uh, cloud solutions. And you also have, the, in other case, the disaster recovery as a service. These are the companies on the picture that can assist you with uh, starting up uh, the disaster recovery as a service in the cloud. IBM goes far with it. Um, there are others like um, very important Verizon. It's, an, it's in fact a network uh, provider, but it also has some data centers in the cloud. Well, it's not in the cloud, in fact. And the cloud is in data centers somewhere else, but you just uh, use the network over the internet or private networks to uh, communicate to these centers um, to have your systems over there. And then you have the techniques to have your systems over there. And you have the cold disaster recovery. The cold disaster recovery is a fact that you are have you rent your hardware over there. Now you have the computers there in standby mode. You have the software there in standby mode, but they are also down. When a disaster happens, you just have to start them up. And so that takes a lot of time, of course, eh, to go. Of course, it's uh, faster than uh, rebuilding your data center from scratch, of course. The warm disaster recovery item is your equipment is in the other data center, data center, the cloud data center, and it is in fact not running, but you just have to launch it. Yeah? So you just switch it on effect, and then your computers are online, they are almost virtual computers, and your databases come online, and you have your data also synced in the other side, so in the couple of hours you are back in business. But that for most companies that's uh, doable, I would say. And the hot disaster recovery, that's a fact. You have to see it as a high availability solution. Your computers are running there always, the applications are running, but they're just not active for the customers. It's a, like you push the button and you push that button and then your internet traffic is rerouted to the cloud and you're back in business. It's in a couple of minutes you're done. Of course, do not forget the MTO, the invocation lead time. It can take hours before you push the button to go to the other side. But these are the three main items in the techniques that you can do for cloud disaster recovery. Also keep in mind that um, backing up to the cloud is also a hot item that uh, is sold a lot. But if you are going in terabyte, forget it. It takes hours, it takes weeks to restore your data. So uh, you have to use it wisely. Uh, if you have less than, less than a terabyte, it's doable with good compressor techniques. Um, but if you are a huge data center in the cloud, it's not always useful. Uh, it's a private, private cloud, on the other hand, with good network connections, then it's another manner. Uh, but what I'm speaking here is the public cloud. Uh, you have to be aware of that. Okay, let's go further. Uh, now I've spoken about the, the complete business continuity planning and I'm going to give you a smaller example about the backup system. Uh, um, you understood that in your disaster recovery site a backup system is very important. If you want to restore your data, you need a backup system over there. And I will give an, as, as an example the Barrios, what the next slide is about that. And you need a disaster recovery plan for your backup system also. Huh? Yeah. It's very important. And therefore, we can use REAR or Relax and Recover, which is an open source project. Uh, not to forget, in your disaster recovery site, your backup data should be available all the time or with backups, uh, with tapes or data replication. Here comes data replication or the cloud storage or maybe the tree. Huh? You have different schemes. And therefore, it's good to select a backup server software that can handle all three of them. I think any backup system can handle tapes. 
that's very old. But as the data is growing, tapes are not fast enough, or tape drives are not fast enough to, to drive everything. Or maybe tape drives are fast enough, but the robots and all the, 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 the handling of the robots or t uh, replacing tapes is not fast enough. So therefore, more and more disks are used. Uh, therefore, the data replication is important and handy. And more, if you have cloud disaster recovery, then you can also put your data in the cloud or part in the cloud, for example, for your backup server. Um, this presentation I talked about uh, your backup server and the backup server that we could propose here is Barrios. What is Barrios? Barrios is in fact a fork of uh, Bacula, maybe it's also an open source uh, backup provider. It started in 2010, they started the fork then. Uh, the URL is mentioned and it's an excellent backup software because it works perfectly with tapes, with disks, uh, data replications understand it well, it works with NAS, it works with SAN, it integrates with the cloud uh, as backup storage and it integrates very well with Relax and Recover. Okay. <coughs> Is anybody using here Barrios by the way? No? Okay. Somebody using another open source uh, solution? Yes? Bacula, okay. Somebody, another open source solution? Backup PC. Backup PC, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Another, a few words about Relax and Recover. That's uh, my other main project. Um, that's a bare metal disaster recovery. A few years ago, I gave a presentation here at TDOS about it. Um, the URL is also there. Um, it's quite hot these days because um, I got a lot of emails, a lot of issues, good, a lot of um, bugs and fixes. I like fixes, by the way. <laughs> okay, what is nice about Relax and Recover? There are not so many um, contenders. Uh, I think uh, there are only a few there. Uh, Mondo Rescue is the main contender, which is about the same age of uh, Relax and Recover, I think. Okay, it takes a snapshot of your running system. Uh, that's very important. You do not have to be offline. For example, if Clonezilla, uh, the best thing to take a snapshot of your system is, is uh, offline. But here you can do it perfectly online. It makes a bootable image, and the bootable image can be on the network with Pixie, can be on an ISO image. An ISO image can be a file, of course. It can also be on a USB stick. USB drive or whatever, that kind of technology. Um, important to restore your server is to have an archive of your data. And the default archiver is in fact TAR. But you can easily use rsync also. These are the native built-ins. And you can also use or integrate it with an external backup solution. And in the external backup solutions, you have two tracks. You have the open source track, which I love, like Barrios, for example, Bacala, um, rsync backup made easy, and duplicity. Duplicity is quite hot these days. Uh, somebody using duplicity here? Okay. Duplicity is a back effect, the real backup cloud. You're backing up to the cloud, and that's the thing you use for it. It's encrypted, using GNU PG for it. So it's quite hot, and it's a uh, Integrated, it works uh, on Census, works on Fedora, it works on SUSE, and it works now also quite well thanks to a lot of fixes that I got from two German people on uh, Debian and uh, it's Ubuntu. So it's working well now. And I like it by the way, oh, duplicity and dupli. Dupli is in fact a, a kind of front end around duplicity. Well, doesn't matter. And then you have the commercial track of backups. And uh, most are there in Tivoli, from IBM, uh, from Semantic and View, from HP Data Protector, Galaxy is from Cipana, NSR is uh, IMC, and SISM ZEP. They're all doing it quite well. What to real effect do with the commercial backups? Uh, you the, just rely on the backup software to make your backups. So Rear says, okay, backup software is doing the full backup of your system. I don't care. But I take the executables 
that you need to restore. Because if you restore, you boot from an ISO image, for example, or USB, and then you want, you have a system in the RAM, and an almost exact system that you're running in production, but you have your only the executables that you need to restore or to talk to the backup server. Uh, and it could be anything. Uh. So it takes the executables and you can talk to the backup server. And then it gives the commands to restore all your data once your uh, file systems has been restored and your disks have been uh, mounted and stuff like that. I don't want to go too technical about relax and recover because that's a separate uh, presentation. Uh, I can give you more and more details about it. So the features about uh, what Rear can offer, uh, it's you have a disaster on your hardware, you can restore on the same hardware. If you replace your hard disk, for example, you can just restore it from the point in time you took your image. If you're using an external backup mechanism, you always have the last backup restored effect that uh, was made before the disaster happened. That can be a few hours before. If you use a TAR archive, that depends. If you do it on a weekly basis, you still have maybe have to restore a few data from the last week after your system is back online. And you can also restore on similar data because your disk is uh, different in size. You have a different kind of hardware, but similar. Huh? Don't expect uh, that you have an Intel based, you can restore it on AMD. You may expect problems, of course. Huh? It has to be uh, similar. Of course, if you go from Intel to uh, Itanium or something, like a power PC, don't expect that will work. Huh? It has to be similar kind of hardware. However, with Rear you can do really a P2V, V2V and V2P. And it does work. Have uh, huge pharmaceutical companies who are doing that. They have a disaster recovery site uh, 200 miles away, and they're doing uh, restores on different hardware. And they really have virtual systems, and they restore on physical systems, and vice versa. And it works. So what does Rear Effect do? Well, they will repartition your hardware. They will re uh, make your file system ready, and will mount it, and then they will initiate the restore. After the restore is finished. It will make your system bootable with grip or something else. And well, that's it, in fact. And you can uh, reboot or inspect your system before rebooting. OK. The integration with Rear and Barrios, uh, because that was the point. Uh, your Barrios system, your backup system is very critical. You have, think about two systems now. You have your clients that are using Barrios to, to take the backup off with, and use Barrios to take backups. If you want to integrate your clients to restore for a disaster, you install Rear on the client and you just say, my backup system with the backup line and configuration file is at Barrios. And that's it. And the only thing you have to do is say Rear minus V for verbose, make rescue, or you can also say make backup. And make backup will not do any backup because you're expecting that Barrios is doing the backup. That's very important. If you use GNU-TAR, then it will make an archive. So therefore, I, I will rather say make rescue. That makes only the ISO image or your bootable image effect. And that's it. And you can store that image on your backup system or your NAS, SAN, whatever, some on a secure place, not on the system itself. It should be separate. But also, your backup server is very important. Yes? Uh, I'm a bit confused about what it's doing with the root partition. Are you just imaging the root and then you restore it? Or do you have knowledge about the, the distributions and you're attempting to yeah. Okay. Files. Okay. The, the question was: uh, Does Rear have knowledge about your root system and about the different distributions? Huh? Yes. Uh, Rear or Relax and Recover does has all the knowledge about your root system because uh, Relax and Recover is in the main concern is your root file system uh, of PG00 whatever. That is the main concern. It is not concerned about your SAN infrastructure. Because sand is protected internally in the sandbox. So and normally I always advise to exclude the sand. Because you, if you want to back up your sand, you have a two terabyte database there. It doesn't make really sense because it's the database is online, not in backup mode. It's, it's useless anyway. So it's about the root file system, uh, or the root file systems. Uh, that's very important. That's the main concern of uh, Relax and Recover. Also, it has a lot of uh, knowledge about different distributions. So SLES, uh, RHEL, uh, CentOS, uh, Ubuntu, uh, Debian, it's all supported. Even Arch is there. 
It also has knowledge about different architectures. PowerPC, Intel is of course the main one. Even Itanium is still there, because I have customers who pay me for maintaining the Itanium track. Um, okay. Um, but going back to this point, uh, backup server, Barrios, also need protection. And you can also use Relax and Recover or Rear for it. But you cannot say backup Barrios, because that would be very stupid uh, to, to use barriers to restore barriers, but your backup server is gone, you cannot restore your backup server. So you should use another mechanism. Therefore, we say, you use something else, we put the backup, we use R, TAR, for example, or R sync, and put it somewhere on another disk, could be a USB disk, could be SAN, NFS, SIFS, whatever, put it separate. You put it somewhere else, and therefore you say NetFS, which is the, the default uh, backup mechanism, and the backup URL defines the location of your archive. Can be anything. Would lead me too far to go in details. And also the output will is effect explaining where which mechanism that you will use to make your bootable image. ISO, USB, that's the most, or Pixie can also be used. Um, but okay, I think for, for a backup server I would not use Pixie because you cannot guarantee that your network is online. I would always use ISO or um, USB. Even you can go further, you can also say ISO physically these days. You can, well, DVDs, eh? not several DVDs. That's also uh, a possibility. Uh, two years ago, some French guys were paid for it, for I think it was for Airbus that worked, um, to make the distributions on an ISO and contain everything on an ISO. So, to DVDs or something like that. And incremental is also possible these days, but okay, that would lead us too far. Important to know, backup server need a different scheme than barriers. And that would be the internal um, way of working the NetFS. Sorry about it. Recovering a system, again, you have two schemes here. The barriers clients, who are using Barrios as a backup server. If something happens with it, you replace the hardware or you put it on another system and you just type real recover. The image that you made for that client knows everything about itself, uh, about its scheme, about its root file systems, what to mount and what to recover effect. And it will communicate you know, once you have an IP address with the Barrios server to restore all the data automatically. And the only thing that you have to do is type rear minus V for verbose, recover. And that's it. It will do all the rest automatically. And again, Barrios is the key there. Um, the second part, if something happens with your backup system, with your Barrios system, and you have to recover it, it's again also the same command, rear recover. But then it will not use Barrios, but it will use the mechanism that you defined, the USB, or the NFS location or the SIF location and restore the data. Once you have your barrier system restored, then you probably use your backup system itself to restore the latest data with tapes uh, or the, the, the cloud storage or another storage that you're using to restore your backups from. That's also important. And to restore the latest backup can also be used to restore the latest data on your clients. Uh, if the barrier system is online, you can restore your latest snapshots from your databases to the point in time that you have the last good backup, of course. All right. Okay. This picture is the picture that I uh, would like that you remember or take away from this presentation. I talked about the four main chapters in business continuity and uh, the prevention is all about risk management, the preparedness, business impact analysis, the response team and the recovery plans, the disaster recovery plans that you made for your IT infrastructure. I just gave an as an example that you could use barriers and relax and recover as part of your recovery plans. It all depends on the hardware, of course. If you have a Solaris system, you cannot use uh, relax and recover to restore, but you use something else. But I'm talking about Linux and other open source distributions that can use barriers for the data. And again, the circle has to be round, so it's not a one-time action, you should do it 
at least yearly to review your prevention plans, your business impact analysis, and do the rehearsals, a rehearsal of recovery plans, and also from the response team. Hopefully you never need them, but if you need them, they should be trained well. And you have to maintain the plans and you have to review them. Okay. And if you have any questions or you want help from me, this is the most funny picture of me, but I found uh, when I was in the States on holiday, I found a disaster recovery team truck. I've seen that picture a few times on the internet and now I saw it by accident. I said, okay, I had my T-shirt with relax and recover with me. Let's put it on and take a picture. <laughs> Okay, that was in fact the, uh, the main presentation I had. If you have any questions, shoot. If there are no questions, I would like to thank you for your attending. <laughs>